Lorena Tefano. Um, a few months ago, a couple of months ago, Miles asked me if I wanted to speak on one of the services while he was away on study leave, and I said, yeah, that's fine. He asked me if I had a topic in mind. It was about the time of the parliamentary protest, and after two years of COVID, and um, during the epidemic, pandemic, we'd seen... Um, Christian groups who've been doing a great job in helping people who were struggling uh, because of the loss of income, couldn't work, whatever. But we saw other Christians or other people who were invoking the name of Jesus in their protests against those same mandates. We had churches like ours who, when given the restrictions of mask wearing and social distancing, said, yeah, that's fine, we'll do that. But there are other churches, some of the leading evangelical churches in the world, who were given the same restrictions said, no, we're not doing that. It's against our rights. It's a violation of our freedoms. So I thought it would be very topical to have a discussion on a Christian perspective on human rights. Uh, it's a complex issue. We're in for the long run today, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. Uh, there's a lot of grey areas, um, but we don't need to be afraid of the grey areas. Jesus is Lord of the grey areas just as much as anything else, but we do need to understand them. We need to have a good grasp of the principles that underlie them. So, let's have a go. Firstly, just quickly, the origin of our human rights is not the Universal Decl Declaration of Human Rights. That just simply recognises what gifts or what, what rights we have. It doesn't create the rights. It says, well, these are the rights pre-existent. Our rights come, we would believe, from the word of God. Before mankind was even made, God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. We are all, each and every one of us, made in the image of God. We all bear the likeness, the similarity with God, and that gives us all incredible value. It makes us all of God is, God is worthy of respect, of all respect, and so are we. We need to respect each other because we bear God's image. The Mosaic law goes on to uh, codify some of those rights that we have. We, we're worthy of respect, uh, our, our right to life, to the protection of our property, the um, sanctity of our marriages, all those things are codified in the, in the law of Moses, many other things apart from the Ten Commandments. So that's where our basic rights come from. The fact that we are made in God's image, we are worthy of respect. Galatians 3 goes on to say in the New Testament, there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male or female, we are all one in Christ Jesus. So there's no one person or no group of people better off, more worthy than anyone else. So we can start off, we can come to this statement here, based on, what the, on the word of God. No one person or group of people is more worthy or deserving of better treatment, of fairer justice, of greater power, of increased opportunities, or of more of the world's wealth and resources than the rest. We are all equal in God's sight. Well, that was easy enough, wasn't it? Let's go have a cup of tea. Uh, sorry, not quite that simple. You see, Jesus reinterprets the Mosaic law radically in the kingdom of God. This is from the Sermon on the Mount, a passage that's so well known. There are several idioms in our English language that come out of this passage, and yet, I think probably the, from my perspective, I think the, the most misunderstood verse in the Bible, that first one there. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone, anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. 
Give to everyone who begs from you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. This verse, turn the other cheek, as I say, a common idiom in our language. It's got nothing to do with how you react to a schoolyard bully. This is about the law. This is about your rights under the law. Lex Talionis, literally the law of the tooth. We read in Exodus 21. If any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. That was the law. So if Bartholomew whacked Nathaniel and knocked out his tooth, Nathaniel's legal right was to go to the court of the day, which was the town elders, and say, look, here's my tooth, here's the two witnesses who saw Nathaniel hit me. Well, Nathaniel was in Bartholomew's room, but wait, Nathaniel hit me. Uh, I want justice. And the town elders would say, is that what you saw? Yes. Okay, fine. Bartholomew, you've got the right to whack Nathaniel and knock out his tooth. That was the law. That was his legal right. Jesus said, turn the other cheek. He whacked you once, now let him slap you as well. Don't claim your rights. This is another example. If you take your neighbor's cloak and pawn, you shall restore it before the sun goes down. For it may be your neighbor's only clothing to use as a cover, and what else shall that person sleep? That's again from Exodus. So let's use a modern day illustration this time. I often borrow uh, Bill Birch's trailer. In fact, I've got it at the moment. And um, when I go to get it, Catherine, if she could do, could say, okay, you're taking the trailer. You don't always bring it back the same day. I'm going to take your jacket as a bond to make sure you bring the trailer back. And if that was in the Old Testament times, even though I'd still had the trailer, at the end of the day I could go back to Catherine and say, I need my jacket back because it might be my blanket and I can't sleep without my blanket. That was the law. Jesus says, if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give them your cloak as well. So what I should do is rather than saying to Catherine, I need my jacket back, she says, you've already got my jacket, here, take my hoodie as well. Don't claim your rights under the law. In Roman civil law, there was a law that said that a Roman soldier could ask any person in a Roman colony to carry their pack, or ask them, order them, to carry their pack for a thousand steps, about a kilometre. To, do, to refuse was a punishable crime. But he couldn't ask them to take it any further. It was also a punishable crime. You can only take it one kilometre. So at the end of one kilometre, having been forced to carry this guy's pack, you could dump it and say, I'm out of here. You've, you've done as much as you can do. I don't have to stay and carry it any further. Jesus says, go the extra mile. He's forced you to carry it one mile. Carry it another mile. Without being forced to. Don't claim your rights. The fourth one. It's just a natural law, isn't it? If you borrow something, you're obliged to bring it back. You don't give it to someone. You lend it to them. The understanding is you bring it back. We look at the Luke version of this verse. It says, if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. So if I don't bring the trailer back, Catherine shouldn't say, oh, excuse me, I need a trailer back. I will bring it back. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay? So whether it's the Mosaic law, whether it's Roman civil law, whether it's just natural law, Jesus is saying, don't. Claim your rights. Paul goes on and makes it even more clearer. In 1 Corinthians, he says this, Do we not have the right to our food and drink? Do we not have the right to be accompanied by a believing wife? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat any of its fruit? Who tends a flock and does not get any of its milk? Does not the law also say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not speak entirely for our sakes? It was indeed written for our sakes. For whoever ploughs should plough in hope, and whoever threshes should thresh in hope 
of a share in the crop. If we have sown spiritual good among you, is it too much if we reap your material benefit? If others share this rightful claim on you, do we not still more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple get their serv- temple service get their food from the temple? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. But I have not made use of any of these rights. Indeed, I would rather die than that. When Jesus taught, the Old Testament teaches, that if you bring spiritual benefit to people, you are entitled to physical benefit back from them. But Paul said, I didn't do that. I didn't claim any of that. In fact, I'd rather die than do that. He didn't, he didn't say you don't have the right. Jesus didn't say you don't have these rights. He says don't claim them. Paul is saying I had the right to expect from the people in Corinth when I was preaching the gospel that they fed me, that they housed me, but I didn't claim any of those rights and I'd rather die than do that. So is that it? Is that the answer? Yes, we do have rights, but we don't claim them. Go have a cup of tea. No, sorry, not so fast again. Sometimes Jesus and Paul did claim their rights. Look at these verses here. Matthew 10, this is when Jesus sent his disciples out on mission. And he said to them, take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. In exactly the same scenario where Paul said, I'd rather die than claim my rights, Jesus is saying, claim your rights. Don't take any money. If your sandals break, it's up to them to give you a new pair. Paul, when he was about to be flogged, I think this is in Philippi, um, when they had tied him up with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who is uncondemned? Roman citizens had more rights than non-Roman citizens. And one of them was that you could not punish them without a fair trial. Paul hadn't been tried, and the town leaders were going to flog him, and he said, you can't do that. It's against my rights. Why? Why did sometimes Paul claim his rights and sometimes not? He tells us. In 2 Corinthians, he says why he didn't claim his rights in Corinth. In other places that he went to, he did claim his rights of food and shelter and stuff, but he said that this in 2 Corinthians, for we're not peddlers of God's word like so many, but in Christ we speak as persons of sincerity, as persons sent from God and standing in his presence. You see, there were in Corinth a lot of people who peddled religion for financial gain. There are a lot of people in the world that do that today. They're not necessarily Christians, these people, they could have been silversmiths or philosophers or who knows, but they peddled religion for financial gain, and Paul didn't want to be associated with any of that, so he said, I'm going to have nothing to do with anything that could associate me with those people, so when I'm in Corinth, I'm going to work, he worked all night making tents and all day preaching the gospel. So he didn't take any money from anybody in Corinth so they couldn't accuse him of peddling the gospel. So we can come to statement number two. Even though we are entitled to certain rights or not, Christians should claim those, oh, sorry, I'll start again. Even though we are entitled to certain rights, whether or not Christians should claim those rights must be guided by biblical principles and individual circumstances. Sometimes we will, sometimes we'll lay them aside. So what principles do we apply? What are the governing principles for whether or not we claim our rights? The first one is very obvious. Our rights are always overruled by our responsibility to love. Look at all these verses. Six times, I think it's the most quoted Old Testament verse in the New Testament. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. Whatever you want for yourself, want it for your neighbour. Whatever you think you deserve, your neighbour deserves it as well. And he goes on. 
Do not seek your own advantage, but that of others. Not only do you put your neighbour equal, you put them ahead of you. Seek it for them first before you seek it for yourself. And then look at this verse here in Galatians 5. For you are called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. Slavery is probably the epitome, isn't it, in our society for a loss of rights. No freedom of movement, no freedom where they work, don't get paid. Just lo- losing all rights. Slaves have got no rights at all, hardly. And Paul says, become slaves to another. Give up all your rights in order to bless and serve each other. And in the Philippians 2, let, it, let each of you look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Couldn't be more clear in Scripture that our rights are overruled by our responsibility to love. The second one is that rights may be given up, but not taken away. Paul could give up the right when he was in Corinth to uh, be fed and, and housed, but it wasn't the Corinthian Christians couldn't say, well, you know, no, we're not going to feed you, we're not going to house you, it's up to you. Okay? Paul could give up the rights, nobody else could take them away from him. In Ephesians 6, regarding slaves, again we read this, slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, and singleness of heart as you obey Christ not only while being watched and in order to please them, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. Render service with enthusiasm as to the Lord and not to men and women, knowing that whatever good we do, we will receive the same again from the Lord, whether we are slaves or free. Um, Slavery in the Bible is an interesting topic. Some people would say that it condones slavery. It doesn't. Um, but it's not something that we can deal with today. In your newsletter, there is a blog, a link to a blog that deals with this issue very well. Um, It's easy to read, but covers the whole thing. And if you're interested in this topic, certainly go and read it. But basically, um, slavery was a fact of life in the Roman Empire. Christianity at that stage was just a small religion with no influence, hanging on to its coattails to Judaism to stay legal, um, and they had no, were not in a position to change the rules on slavery. Uh, it was illegal for a Roman slave owner to set all his slaves free. So if a slave owner became a Christian, he couldn't just let all his slaves give them all freedom. That was against the law, and if he tried to do that, they wouldn't actually be free at all. And somebody else could grab them and say, oh, you're going to be my slave now. Okay? So basically, slavery was a fact of life, and Paul says to the slaves, this is the situation you're in, accept it, serve your masters with enthusiasm, respect your masters, as if work for them as if you're working for the Lord. But then he says to the masters, do the same. Treat them the same. Don't threaten them, for you know that both of you have the same master in heaven, and with them there is no partiality. Remember the verse we read before in Galatians, there's no longer slave nor free. You're all equal. So, yes, your master, your your slave, he says to them, love your neighbour as yourself, respect your master, but he says to the master, you do the same. You love your slave. You You give up all your rights and become a slave to your slave. You can't set them free. It's against the law, but you don't treat them like a slave. You treat them like persons of respect made in the image of God. Don't take away their rights. But why? Why, why? why all this? What if, what if the master isn't kind? Why do we give up our rights? What's the purpose for it? First Peter chapter 8, chapter 2, sorry. This is, a, this is a hard saying. This sort of goes against the grain for us in the society, society we live in. Slaves accept the authority of your masters with all deference. Not only those who are kind and gentle, but also those who are harsh. For it is to your credit if, being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, where is the credit in that? 
But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. So even if your master is harsh and he doesn't treat you fairly and he denies you your rights, continue to serve, continue to love. Don't take this passage too far. Don't try and make a hard and fast rule out of this. This is specifically about slaves. Don't take from this and make a, a rule out of it that we have to stay in abusive relationships or work for abusive bosses. Um, you know, the Bible says, you know, say if there's a sexual abuse, well, the Bible says flee sexual immorality. So don't make a rule out of this. What we say from this verse, what we take out of this verse is that the principle that we um, give up our rights, our rights are overruled by our responsibility to love, is not negated if it is not reciprocated. Okay? We are commanded to love our neighbour. If our neighbour doesn't love us back, it doesn't mean we, don't, we can stop. We say, oh, blow you. Okay? Our, rights are not, our, our rights are not abrogated if they are not reciprocated. But why? As I said before, why, do, why, why should we? What's the purpose why work for somebody? Why stay in a relationship? Why can you love somebody who doesn't love us back? In the middle of this verse is a great little clause. Being aware of God. Being aware of God. What's that mean? Being aware of God's nature. God is a God of love. God is a God of grace. God is a God who is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to forgiveness. God is a God of justice and he has provided a means whereby we who do not deserve to be in a relationship with him can have it. That's what being aware of God is. Being aware of the gospel. Going back to the passage from 1 Corinthians we read before. If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we still more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. And then a bit later he goes on to say, I have become all things to all people so that I might by any means save some. I do it for the sake of the gospel so that I may share its blessing. The gospel is all important. Everything we do, everything we say, how we apply these principles is all dependent on what is best for how the gospel can be spread and shared. Let's try and put this into a couple of applications, see where we end up. First one, should Christian employees go on strike? So last year, nurses went on strike. This, this week or next week, other health workers are going to do the same. Planning to do the same. Are they right? Uh, we've got plenty of nurses in the room. The union calls you out on strike. Do you go on strike or do you say, no, 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 I have to keep working dutifully for my employer? Let's apply the principles to see where we end up. Our rights are always overruled by our responsibility to love. Now, I would argue, and you know, this is my opinion, as I say, there are a lot of grey areas, but I would say nurses and healthcare workers and doctors and stuff, caring for others is their job, it's their vocation, it's their passion, it's why they do what they do. So it should be easy for them to say, yeah, okay, I'll go along with that. That's my job, that's, what I, that's why I'm a nurse. But I would argue that it's not possible to do that properly if the hospital is under-resourced, if they're understaffed, if they're so tired, if they're so thinly spread that they cannot care for their patients properly, then going on strike may be a short-term pain for a long-term gain so that they can be properly resourced so that they can do their job properly. So I would argue that going on strike is actually support this this principle, this principle actually supports going on strike for nurses so that they can be properly paid and uh, they can have sufficient staff to do their job correctly. 
that they can properly put other people's needs and meet their needs as they're required. Rights may not be given up, but not taken away. There was a guy on news, TV One News during the week, he says, I, he's a health worker of some sort, he says, I work 10 hours every week, unpaid overtime. We read this verse in Corinthians, but it quotes the Old Testament, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Um, in pre-industrial days, uh, a farmer reaped his crop, and then he laid it out on a hard, flat surface, and he got the ox to walk all over it to break the heads of grain off from the chaff. And while the ox was doing that, it was not, not allowed to be muzzled, according to the Old Testament law. The ox was doing the work. It was entitled to eat as much as it wanted to. The government cannot deny nurses and health workers a fair wage. If that guy is doing 10 hours a week extra work, he deserves, it's his right to be paid for it. The government cannot say, well, you yeah, do the work, but I'm not going to pay you. It's a contradiction of that, breaks that right. So, for me, no worries. If I see nurses out picketing, I'll give them a toot for sure. I think they're doing the right thing. But let's take this example. Some of you will remember, not too many of you probably, back in the 1970s, the cooks every Christmas holidays, Cooks and Stewards Union would go on strike uh, for better wages on the inter island ferries because you couldn't go on the Aramoana across to Picton without buying a hot pie and a cup of tea and they always did it just on Christmas. Everybody's holiday plans were all disrupted, held the government to ransom and usually got their pay rise. Were they motivated by responsibility to love? They were deliberately doing the exact opposite. They were preying on people's, ruining their plans, bringing them you know, misery and everything else just to, for their own gain. So no, I don't think so. Were their rights being denied? They were already paid a fortune, as far as I can recall. So no, I don't think so. Okay, so even just an issue, you can see how it's grey area here. The issue is should Christians go on strike? There's no hard and fast rule. There are some principles, and they may apply, or they'll apply, but sometimes the answer will be yes, and sometimes the answer will be no. So let's turn to this one. Three caveats before I start. I'm not talking about COVID as a myth created by the Illuminati to gain world domination. I'm not talking about COVID vaccine is the mark of the beast. I'm not talking about COVID vaccine. You've got 5G, nano, whatever's, and you need to wear a tinfoil helmet to ward off the rays from the towers. Okay? It's all that one. So we're not going there. Talking about people who are genuinely concerned with the issue of people's welfare. Some, some of us would say this. There has been too much focus on saving lives and not enough on saving livelihoods. The emotional, financial and mental health cost has been too high. Hundreds of people, thousands of people have lost their livelihoods, their businesses, especially in the hospitality and tourism areas. Businesses have gone bankrupt, they've lost all their money, people haven't been able to work. The cost for those people has been huge. People have been able to go to funerals for their you know, fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters and sons and daughters and whatever else because of mandates about travel. The emotional cost of that must be horrendous. People have been split up. Families have been split up. Father in one country, mother, wife and children in another country for... Years, 18 months or more. How do you cope with that? The, the cost, the financial, the mental health cost has been horrendous brought about by those mandates. And some people say it's been too high. Some people, though, say this. If New Zealand had not enacted the COVID mandates, our death toll would be 80,000 people. That's what one of the epidemiologists said. 
it's 1,000. 79,000 New Zealanders still alive would be dead at that rate. That's about four of you, four of us. In this room, four people here today, going by statistics, would not be here if we had done nothing and COVID ran rampant through our community. Some people say we need to help people in the unfortunate situation that they find themselves in. They can't work, their jobs are gone, they can't travel to their work, whatever else, they've got no income, they can't get to the shops, whatever else it is. They're in a really unfortunate situation and we need to help them, so we need to provide food parcels and Christian churches have been at the forefront of doing that and it's really good to see. Other people say the reason that people are in such an unfortunate situation needs to be changed. Rather than being the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, we need to be building the fence at the top of the cliff. Deal with the issue, not deal with the consequences. And so people have said, we're not going to obey those mandates. We're going to, not going to comply. Who's right? Who's wrong? Both right, both wrong. Could all be right. They could all, with the possible exception of Michael, possible exception of Michael Jones, there, they could all be wrong, depending on your motivation. See, if you are saying, yes, COVID mandates are too strict, too harsh, and too many people have had their livelihoods destroyed, their mental health has suffered, and you're saying it because you're concerned about them, fair enough, that's a valid argument. Just also valid, though, that if you say, well, you know, we've got to save lives. That's a valid argument. So there's no right or wrong answer. We will all find a position somewhere along that continuum where, you know, our government's taken a point really far out on the saving lives thing, end of the spectrum, haven't they? Some of us think maybe it should have been a little bit more back the other way. Maybe some more people may have died, but lots of people may have had a better uh, chance of saving their livelihoods and their mental health would be better. So both those arguments are right if they're both concerned with other people. I'm loving other people and so I'm concerned about their livelihoods. I'm loving other people and so I'm concerned about their lives. We may disagree, but there shouldn't be any discord for where we, we can see other, you know, respect other people's opinions <coughs> And, and so there shouldn't be any discord among us. But there are other people who say, no, I don't want mandates because I want to go on my overseas trip or I want to go and stay in my batch in Whangapatao or I've got to go and feed my horse down in the Waikato. And their motives are entirely selfish. Or as a letter to the editor last week, some 96-year-old wrote in and said, if I get COVID, I'm going to die, so we should keep the borders closed and stay at red traffic lights sort of understandard reasoning, but she's being entirely selfish. If she wants to isolate, she can isolate. There's no reason why a team of five million should all have to isolate and, and have their lives, livelihoods destroyed. Okay, not being too harsh on her, but okay, you can understand that the position can be, I'm concerned about others, and so I'm going to try and help them, or I'm going to argue against mandates, or my, my position can be entirely selfish, and so I say I'm not going to comply with the mandates uh, because it doesn't suit my needs. So you can see how this issue is definitely a grey one, um, but the principles stay the same. The principles don't change. And the principles need to guide our thoughts and actions. So, final statement, finishing statement three. Sometimes we will lay aside our rights. Sometimes we will claim our rights. The deciding factor is our desire to love our neighbour as ourselves. Our motivation always is that the gospel is proclaimed. In any situation, it should be our first thought, how can I best show love 
to my neighbour? What do I say? What do I do to best show love to my neighbour? Because in me showing love to my neighbour, the gospel is proclaimed. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you for all your goodness to us. Thank you you've given us life, you've given us freedom, you've given us choices. You've also given us commands to love our neighbours, ourselves, to take to consider ourselves as slaves to serve each other. Lord God, we pray that everything we do, every action that we take, every word that we say, we're motivated by a desire to show love to our brothers and sisters, to our neighbours around us, in order that the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the salvation that you offer, may be spread abroad and accepted. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.